Tonight's story was made using an improvisational story-building method designed to help collaborators progress quickly from a concept to a complete first draft. The entire creative process took place in real time on a public forum. You can visit the link below to view the original. Now here's the story, dramatized and unedited. The Hungry Tree A Rapid Collaboration by Jeremy Loomis and Jason Chabin it began on an autumn day that actually felt like an autumn day. And this was great, because this day was filled with people who loved a good autumn day. This was a brisk autumn day in New Jersey. The problem with New Jersey was that there were some really lovely people there. Well, no, that wasn't the problem with New Jersey at all. The problem was that they were there while some really unlovely things were also there. There were two men, both of darkened coat and goateed face, and they were called in from New York to handle a disturbance. And that was actually all they had to go on, was that there was a disturbance. Which was an annoyance, and yet a persuasive annoyance, because the voice on the other end had spoken of this disturbance with incredible conviction. These two men just had to know what it was about. But by now, you must be wondering who these mysterious men are. Well, I'll tell you. The one in the hat was named Deputy, because, I don't know why, go ask his mother. And the hatless man was named Timothy Thomas, but his friends, and even some of his enemies, called him Timmy Tom. I can't wait to get that promotion, said Deputy, as he scratched the window of the train on the way to Hackensack. You're going to have to wait, said Timmy Tom, as he flipped over his Sudoku collection and puzzled over a clue that had been scribbled on the back cover by a very small, and intriguingly small, friend of theirs, from back in New York. No, that isn't true, said Deputy, feigning confidence to the max. I won't let it be. True. Deputy, Timmy Tom muttered, puzzle over this jank with me, would you? And Deputy leaned in to wonder at the back of the Sudoku book. It looks kind of like language, but it didn't look English, whatever it was. And when the whisper came, Timmy Tom said, Not sure I heard you right, Deputy. Say that again? To which Deputy replied, I thought you whispered that. I thought you said, It has peculiar tastes. That's what I thought you said, cried out Timmy Tom, and made a dash for the door. Deputy followed close behind, but when they spied out the hall, there was only a frail old man nearing the opposite end of the train. No time to think! Let's get him! Timmy Tom shouted, and Deputy took off his shoes, his own shoes, presumably to run faster, but actually to feel the train's carpet on his toes. He was out to make the best of this job in at least the simplest of ways. I'll beat him to the ground and you can talk to him! Deputy called out, even though by now he was well behind Timmy Tom. But when Deputy caught up and joined Timmy Tom beyond the back door on the caboose, they saw a strange thing. Or rather, they didn't. Where did the old man go? Timmy Tom whispered. Do you think he might have passed away? Deputy asked, in truest ignorance of the way this world does its stuff. I do not, replied Timmy Tom, with a hero's stance. Well, what now then? It was at that precious mo precise it was at that precise moment that Deputy looked down over the rail and saw the base of the train lighting up with flames. The flames licked the sides of the train, beginning near the front but quickly prevailing toward the caboose. How is the metal on fire? Deputy screamed like a girl and without a question mark. Timmy Tom opened the door again and felt the heat even before he saw the fireball charging them. Jump, said Timmy Tom. Jump as if your life depended on it. I only jump because I want to. In that most convenient following moment, Timmy Tom and Deputy leaped from the back of the train and caught hold of the low branches of an entirely normal looking tree. Timmy Tom did quite well with it, but Deputy got the wind knocked out of him and had a sharp branch whip through one of his ears, which is nasty to talk about or to really clearly visualize. Will you look at that, said Timmy Tom. In a minute, 
said Deputy, as he vomited both his toaster strudel and the full bag's worth of pork rinds that he had eaten on the train. There he is, right there! And Timmy Tom pointed at the little old man, who had gotten himself up onto the roof of the train, to do a bit of quiet journaling. Oh, well, we found him then, said Deputy. But I don't think we'll be getting much more information from the likes of him. Do you? Depends on if my wristwatch that shoots little grappling hooks works or not, Timmy Tom said, looking so sly. And Timmy Tom pulled up his sleeve to the elbow, exposing a brightly colored wristwatch that looked like it had been designed with their present needs in mind. Here goes nothing, quoth the Timmy Tom, and pressed the button on the side. And nothing at all happened. Piece of dumb, stupid trash, Timmy Tom said, fighting to free himself from the cool watch that he now hated. Timmy Tom cast the watch to the tracks below, and that was when a tiny grappling hook shot out from the watch, seeming to take direct aim toward the old journaling man. And wouldn't you know, this little watch held enough line to reach him, too! And when the hook did at last reach him, for the train was still traveling and burning at an alarming rate, it stuck a hole in his hat and ripped it clean off. Though the man was at some distance now, Deputy thought that he looked disappointed. That's a relief, though, Deputy exclaimed with a sigh. That hook might have jabbed right into the man himself. Hey, do you see that? Timmy Tom called down, having climbed higher in the tree. We jumped off not too far before our stop. Maybe we'll get to track this guy down after all. And as he focused, even Deputy could see the train slowing to a stop and exploding like a faulty rocket. I'm still glad the grappling hook wasn't how he died, said a shoeless deputy as he and Timmy Tom walked the long walk into Hackensack. Our visit, Timmy Tom muttered. Already marked with tragedy. What can it mean? Deputy was more emotionally distanced at the moment, because it had rained before they arrived, and the ground was squishing mud into his socks. They came upon a river, a really awful one, with slimy, gross mud on its banks. And Deputy said, This is the worst body of water I've ever seen. I'm glad it's cold out because that helps me not to want to go into it. And it wasn't only the river. The fields looked wrong. Deputy, said Timmy Tom, does this park right here look like a small child was told to mow it without being taught how to mow, and then that the same child went and drenched it with a super soaker filled with weed killer instead of mowing it at all? That's what I was thinking, yeah, said Deputy, wide-eyed. But, but... But this whole place can't be like this, Deputy cried out. I've been here before. I do not accept this outcome. Look at this, Timmy Tom said with contempt. He pointed up a tree trunk. First, there was a nailed-in sign that read Hiking Trail. And if that weren't bad enough, there were deep marks all the way up the trunk where hikers had gotten just a little too high-cappy with their cleats. Oh. Hi, said a nearby tree with a face. Deputy couldn't interpret the tone of its voice, let alone its expression. The tree sounded sleepy, if anything, and it looked kind of like it was off its rocker, which, it occurs to me now, might be a fairly offensive expression to use in tree culture. Is it because of you? Deputy demanded of the tree. What is what? The tree asked. You're a freak of nature! Deputy screamed. Are you the reason that everything wrong has happened here? Good question. The tree spoke as if it were winter already. Don't be coy, tree, Timmy Tom demanded. I watched a man die today. And Timmy Tom fell to his knees. I can't get the image out of my brain. The tree appeared mesmerized in a glazed over way. I wish about knees, said the tree. What? Timmy Tom asked. Um, I can't fall to my knees. 
Just an observation. That old man made an observation too, Timmy Tom said. It was about you, I think. And then the little whisper came again. Deputy, did you just say that I'm barking up the wrong tree? Hmm? Deputy offered in defense. I didn't hear anything, the tree said. Me neither, said Deputy, removing his hat and wiping his nose with it and trying to decide whether to put it back on. Wait a second. Wait just one moment in time. What do we have here? And stowed away within the dark hood of Timmy Tom's dark hoodie was Toadly, the very small and vaguely aforementioned frog friend. Hi, Toadly, Deputy waved. Hi, Deputy, said Toadly. Jimmy Tom, the old man wasn't your informant. What? what, what, what? Timmy Tom asked, bewildered. What? <coughs> Deputy said, beginning to choke upon his own saliva. Are you all right, Deputy? asked Toadly. I'll be fine, Deputy said. I, I shouldn't have thought of lemons just then. Yes, Timmy Tom, Toadly said, gaining momentum. I was the informant in the train. It was me the whole time. I was also the one who gave you the tip about the disturbance here in Hackensack. Why? How does that even try to make sense? Timmy Tom asked, totally pitching a fit. Wait, is this the tree then? Deputy asked. The one with, what was it? Peculiar tastes? And Deputy looked down at his hat, still in his hand, and he pitched it into the very mouth of the tree. Wow! The tree said. Wow! That's good cooking! Good cooking! That's what I always say! The tree added. Yes! said Toadly. This tree was the disturbance. And so this monstrous tree is why the river is nasty? And why the fields are a mess? And the other trees have scarred up bark? Deputy was hard pressed to believe it. It all comes down to this hungry tree? Sure, said Toadly. Maybe. I don't know anything about all that. Ah, oh, what? Deputy groaned. You mean that's gonna probably just remain a mystery after we're finished here? Probably it was just people. People who have no natural love for their own land, Toadly said, leaping off of Timmy Tom's hoodie and onto a discarded and heavily weathered soap box. It was probably the same kind of people who made such a grotesque tree happen. And I saw this tree in the background of a picture once, and he was chomping on a guardrail. And I hate him, and I'm gonna kill him! You want to kill him for jumping a guardrail? Timmy Tom asked. Did this tree ever endanger anyone by eating it? Deputy asked. I don't know, said Toadly. I don't think so. I think the guardrail had fallen out of use. That's not the point at all. We're all waiting to hear the point, said Timmy Tom with the greatest of calm. I'm still waiting for it till I hear it, said Deputy with an expression of facefulness, with an expression full on the face. Nah. We all are, said the hungry tree. Timmy Tom, said Toadly, give the tree this soap box. And Toadly leaped down to the ground as Timmy Tom carried the weathered empty crate to the tree. Why? Timmy Tom asked. <laughs> Toadly answered. Because I want to shame him before he dies. Timmy Tom turned back toward the tree but saw that its mouth had closed completely. What's the matter, hungry tree? Timmy Tom asked. That's made of wood, like me, the tree said. Oh, yeah, Deputy said. That's dumb. To give a tree wood to eat? Totally, you're being dumb. Totally was cackling now. <laughs> but he seemed to have a frog in his throat, so it was a warbling, crackling cackle. I'm going to kill this tree, and it doesn't end no matter what. I know you wanted that to sound cool, Deputy said, but it's coming out sounding as dumb as it actually is. Totally, come on. Yeah, totally, really foolish, said Timmy Tom. 
Timmy Tom and Deputy stepped aside and totally never left Timmy Tom's sight. We can't let him kill the tree, Timmy Tom said. Yeah, but how's he going to? Deputy asked. Look at his little arms. Observe his little mind. Mm, true enough, said Timmy Tom. What are you suggesting, then? We leave him here to try? Well, Deputy answered. Thing is, we will never hear the end of it from him if we force him to go back with us. You know that Toadley will find a way to get back here, as long as his little heart is set on it. He's a wily little devil. Yeah. Yeah. I want to bring him back just as bad as you do. Totally can get into little places I can't fit in. Sometimes I get him to steal cheese from mice for me. But we gotta let him tire himself out on his dream. We have to let go, don't we? We do. Timmy Tom and Deputy returned to Toadley, just as the little fellow was speaking more feverish gibberish. <laughs> perhaps to the tree, and perhaps only to himself. The cackling was quieter now. Some stories don't end the way that people like them to, he said. The tree smiled at Toadley, or in spite of him, or it was hard to tell. It looked like a smile. Might not have been one. Deputy rested a hand against the hungry tree and whispered, You're going to be fine. I'll stake everything I own on that. And my wife and children someday. I'm really sure. Timmy Tom crouched down to say goodbye to Toadley. I should step on you for this, he said. But I'm going to let you have your way. Toadley smiled up at him. I love you, Timmy Tom. Love, Timmy Tom said back. You don't know love, little frog. You know just enough to think you're dangerous. And so, Timmy Tom and Deputy booked a flight back to New York, because Timmy Tom decided that he didn't want to risk getting on another burning train, and Deputy decided that if his mode of transit were to catch fire again, he wanted to be in the middle of the sky when it did. And Toadley began his assault on the hungry tree. With his full weight, he kicked the tree right above the left eye, and nothing happened. And as he became more daring, he tried kicking the hungry tree in the teeth. Totally watched a lot of crime drama back in New York, and this method had proven effective on screen more than once. And more than once, Toadley was sure that it was all over for his little froggy frame, because he came near enough for the tree to chomp him in one easy chomp. But the tree never ate him. And for the next ten years, stopping only for eating and for replenishing his strength so as to stay sharp and for mating so as to produce offspring in the hope that he might indoctrinate tadpoles to take up his cause, totally continued, relentless. And the tree even asked him, How will you defeat me? More curious than anything. And totally said, The same way I would eat an elephant. One bite at a time. And Toadley's attempts were more fierce than that of any frog before him, as he tried to stick the hungry tree's bark with his little frog tongue. I will cause you in your entirety to pass through my warring digestive tract, Toadley insisted, but it was never to be. So when he became old and crazy and forgot what he was doing, Toadley rested in the tree, finding that it was more familiar to his little soul now than most things were, having forgotten even the faces of the friends he had known in his old life. And he found comfort in the branches of that sleepy tree. And as his eyes went, he knew only that the bark was something for him to hold. And he knew that its scent had become home to him. He could no longer remember what the fighting had been about. And then, well then, he could no longer even remember the fighting. And when the day came that he breathed his last, Toadley's stubborn old body hardened and dulled, and eventually became indiscernible to the naked eye, as though it were simply part of the tree, the tree that had come to be a home to all his children, and their children, a home to all the little tree frogs who had come to love old Toadley, 
though they had never really understood what he was at. And within this span of time, Timmy Tom and Deputy both moved on from the force. Timmy Tom completed his MBA, met and married the love of his life, and had three lovely children. Deputy was able to buy a speedboat and a horse, but lost them both during a tricky accident. Then, before he quite yet reached his 40s, he won some commercial real estate in an important fishing contest and married the Queen of England, who had been following the news about him for quite some time. But that is another story for another day. The End. Pleasant dreams, everyone.